بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا اللهم زدنا علما إنك أنت عليم الحكيم اللهم اجعل هذه المحاضرة حجة لنا لا حجة علينا يا رب العالمين أما بعد <تصفيق> Today, inshallah ta'ala, um, as, as, as has been going on for the past couple of weeks, um, alhamdulillah, we're, we're blessed to have one of the scholars of Mecca um, to take his time out to come to America <coughs> to benefit uh, some of the Muslims here in America. So today's program, inshallah ta'ala, is going to consist of... Um, the Sheikh is going to be giving a talk briefly, but he wanted, you know, we just wanted to say some of the things that we observed and that he observed while being here in America. One of the things that, understand that there's vending next door. So anyone that's interested in buying stuff is there's vending uh, next door. And the food, the food is next door too. Right. The vending and the food is next door, out front to the right. Out front and the building next door. Right. The Sheikh's visit and his schedule, he's going to change his schedule. I think we burnt him out a little bit. I don't think he anticipated um, the influx of people, the questions, um, a lot of the issues that we have. I don't, I'm not sure if he anticipated that. But one thing that he did mention is that you guys need your own people here to study and learn Islam to come back and be more of an aid. And this is an encouragement for the brothers and sisters to go and seek knowledge, come back, and be of assistance um, to help the people in the community. Um, uh, since he's been here numerous times, y'all, numerous, numerous questions. When he asks the question, he'll say to us, y'all know better than me. Ask the people now when you don't know right. The question goes, let me turn it back to us. Y'all know better than me. Y'all know your people. You know your people better than me. And he said numerous times, which, of course, we're not trying to. We're not able to do everything. So. It's, it's an encouragement that it needs to be some people, some of us are going to have to sacrifice to learn on a higher level. On a higher level than just the general, I can catch a class here and there. If we if we serious about Islam remaining in our families and our communities and stuff like that. At some point, we're going to have to start sacrificing the same way, same way we're willing to sacrifice <coughs> our kids for sports. And we're willing to sacrifice our kids for school, right? That type of level of sacrifice is going to be needed uh, if we're serious about remaining Muslims and leaving a, a, a legacy behind as Muslims and Islam being left behind in our families. So point being, he said to us numerous times, not once, almost every day, y'all know better than me. Y'all know the people better than I do. And he even said some of the, he said some of the problem is, <laughs> is that the people understand on a certain level, meaning every person understands from a per the people from, as we say, from their culture or something like that. Because some of the questions come up, and they might be connected to things on the backdrop that <coughs> Sheikh doesn't understand that. They don't have those issues in this country. So therefore, he might not be able to answer the question, or he might have to answer the question only according to what he knows. He can't go further than that like anybody else. So that was just a strong point that he made over and over and over. At some point, y'all, at some point, Everybody not going to be, you know what I'm saying, basketball players and foot sports. Everybody's not going to be that. Some of us should aspire. We should want to be the next, right, scholar in Islam. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing low about that. As Muslims, some of us going to have to, we should. We should want that for our kids. We should want that for our community. And that's been the encouragement since he came. Another, <clears throat> another thing you mentioned, too, is the, the questions, right? Um, we as a as a community when we ask questions we have a tendency of of giving a whole story and uh he said to us he says you know i've been giving fatwas in the huddle for a long time um the people they know when they come to ask a question they get to their question and they they leave he said but i noticed here and specifically said the women he said they'll come and ask a question and and once you give an answer maybe they don't like it they want to try to explain it a different way but say the same thing and he said, you know, sometimes when you have a question, get your question out, get the answer, whether you like it or you don't like it, take it, bismillah, and go. 
He said that the process, that he said one time, he said, this is one of the reasons why he's tired. He said, people come, and he kind of blamed us too, because he said, yeah. people come and they ask the same questions, like, what are y'all doing? What are y'all doing? Y'all need, need, need to be doing more. And he also, this is an admonishment for me, he and I, he said that, you know, your, your tolerable, meaning your seeking knowledge, didn't stop when you graduated from the university. He said, you guys come back to America, and he's going over stuff with us now. He's like, what have you guys been doing? And so it was uh, kind of like shining a light on us, like you guys are shot out. You guys are not where you're supposed to be, so you got to tighten up. This is admonishment for us. Now, we can take it. How many love? But this is also goes back to our community. Islam, learning Islam don't just start and stop. Okay, I got Arabic, I'm good, I can translate. Learning Islam don't stop with going overseas for six months. Okay, I'll stay a little bit, I'm good. Learning Islam don't start with, or doesn't stop with, okay, I went to the university, I graduated, I came back, I'm good. No, some of the early men would even say in the past that your seeking knowledge starts when you graduate from the university. I believe when Sheikh Abdul Musan al-Abad, he, he, I think he said the statement that Talib al seek seeking knowledge starts when you finish the university. And so I say all that to say, he admonished us, rightfully so. We, you know, coming here back to America, you get busy with the dunya. Everybody got to eat, you got to do this, you got to do that. So Talib al is not at the level where it should be. Especially when you have your own teacher here and he's like looking at you like, what, in heaven, like, what have you been doing? Y'all been playing around. So this is, <laughs> I'm serious. So this is one of the reasons he said, look, I need to focus on y'all because y'all got to tighten up. Um, in addition to that, as a community at large, we all need to tighten up. If we got to tighten up, then what about everybody? Hey, y'all got to tighten up too. It ain't just for us. Everybody got to tighten up. When it comes to learning the slam, we all have a part to play. At the end of the day, we're not going to be here forever. He and I were talking the other day, and we were going over uh, some, of the, some of the speech of the scholars of the past. And say, so, Yali, if you look, most of them died between the ages of 60 and 75. Most of the son of, they died between the ages of 60 and 75. He said, look at you guys. What are you going to put forth before your time go, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you out back? And this is not just for us. It's for all of us. We have children. How are we raising our children? Are we ensuring that our children are practicing Islam? And them being Muslim or not, that's not, we don't, we don't get to make that decision, but what we do get to make is a decision to guide them, to put them along the right path. At the end of the day, many of us are, are first generation Muslims, which means that Islam starts with us. When you're dead and gone, how long is that legacy going to remain? A lot of it has to do with the work that you all, we all put in from now to determine, you know, we'll be in our graves in 100 years. Everybody in this room. Nobody's going to be alive in this room in 100 years. Nobody. Not one of us. But what we do while we're here is going to determine our lineage, our legacy, our children, their children. Um, and last, I want to say this. Uh, when we were in school in Saudi, a lot of the students, the Saudi students, would be surprised because, mashallah, you guys accepted Islam. Right? And then, you know, I would feel some type of way, and I would ask them, well, who's the first Muslim in your family? And they'd be like, well, my family, you know, Islam go back to us during the time of the Sahaba, right? You know, I could trace my lineage back to somebody from the Sahaba or somebody from the, the students of the Sahaba or somebody that came after them. So when he said that to me, it made me think about us, where we come from. Many of us are first generation Muslims. Depending on how we practice our Islam, maybe 100, 200, 300 years from now, your family say, look, my the first person in our family is my great-great-grandfather such and such, or my great-great-grandmother such and such. They established this land for us. And that comes with knowledge. And lastly, one conversation we had on the way here today, he said a lot of your problems in America come from ignorance. He said we make practicing Islam difficult because we don't know, meaning because we in America don't know. And the reality is this, we don't know everything. If you want to look at the knowledge of Islam, we might got this much. So. Maybe less than that, right? That's fine, but where do we all go? Is, is everybody going to rely on one person, two people, three people, four people? If it's something important to everybody here, everyone is going to go and try to find out what they need to go to master, no matter what it is. If it, if it has to do with making money, you're going to know, you're going to find out what you need to know to make money. 
whatever you want to, if it's a job, you want to study whatever it takes so you can master that job so you can get the money that you need to get. Everyone's going to do that. With Islam, we got to do the same thing, if not more. We're talking about our akhirah. We're talking about uh, establishing our permanent residence when this life is over. Because understand something, brothers and sisters, the next life is khayrun wa abaqa. It's better and it's, it'll never end. It'll never end. Anyway, you want to uh, Lastly, part of the learning was not that everybody is expected to be the imam of a masjid, a sheikh, or a student. Now, that wasn't the issue. The issue is we take a lot of the, the smaller issues and we make them more important than the bigger issues. So our focus will be on the tedious things instead of focusing on the main goal, the, the maqasid of Islam. What does Islam come with? The main goals? We give less attention to that and we give more attention to what about if this happens, if, 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 all these ifs. And a lot of times when people came to ask us to the question, they said, well, did it happen? No, it didn't happen. Well, come back when it happens. What if this happens and this happens? And this and this and this and this and this. And we got to understand that when it comes to questions, it's a lot of information that the one you're asking might need to know first. That's why when a question is asked, sometimes, and this always happens, not just with Sheikh Muhammad, you ask the Sheikh a question, the Sheikh might ask you three or four questions before he answers. But we come, just a light little question I want to get off real quick. And then the, the person you're asking needs to know, he needs to know more information, right? And then it gets so deep, it gets to the point where, wait a minute, because it's going down a rabbit hole. Is this what really happened? No, this never happened. So what we just, you know what I'm saying? And there's nothing wrong with knowing, but that's not how, now, you're not going to learn Dean just from Q&A. At some point, you got to say to my, you got to say, everybody got to say, listen, let me take this one hour a week and dedicate it to learning. I'm going to just go to a class for one, once a week. Class only an hour. No matter where you go in the city, more than likely the class only an hour, hour and 10 minutes, maybe less. You're not going to be in a normal weekly class for two hours at a time. More likely it's going to be like one hour. At some point we got to take that and plot it in our lives, make it, okay, one hour a week I'm going to dedicate to learning. And then over time, over time, we become not the most knowledgeable. We become more knowledgeable than we were before we went to that class. And that's why Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, he said in the Ramah, dhahab anhu jumla. Whoever, whoever, Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, Imam al-Zuhri, rahimahullah, he says, whoever tries to get knowledge all at one time, they're going to lose it all at one time. You don't get knowledge, for example, this one day we're going to be here for a couple hours. What that's called is a benefit. We got some benefit today. Alhamdulillah. That doesn't mean we left, I sat with the sheikh, he was going in, ah, and then we really think we reached some type of level. That's not how it's going to work. And if we keep approaching it like that, we're going to keep coming up short. So the point was that not everybody's going to be some extensive scholar, but no, there's certain things, basics, those basics, those pillars, certain things we should all know. We should all focus on or be trying to know, be trying to, be trying to get to that point. Uh, that was the point about, as far as you're talking about learning when it comes to questions. A lot of the questions are very tedious, very, very tedious, which assumes, okay, so in that case, if you come with a detailed question like that, you must understand the, you know, the general stuff very well to be that the, the fact that you've gone that far in the question. I hope that makes sense. That makes sense. Inshallah. <laughs> Tayyip. Uh, Ramadan. Huh? Ramadan. Ramadan is coming. This is just an update. What's going on? Ramadan is coming, so we starting to prepare for Ramadan. Uh, if anybody was here last Ramadan, we had a couple issues, y'all. So we trying to, we trying to fix them before Ramadan comes. Part of it was in the bathrooms with the toilets and stuff and the sinks. So we're trying to make sure we can raise enough money to replace the toilets so that we don't have the, uh, the toilets down during Ramadan and Tarawi and stuff like that. We had a couple problems with that last year. We're not trying to do that again. We've got to keep calling Rota Rota every couple of days. So we're trying to raise some money for that, inshallah. Uh, yes? Well, how much is one toilet? How many toilets do we need? He got an estimate for three. It's three toilets. And everything that they got to do with the placements and the Naeem should have been here for this. Kind of but the esp they commercial. We supposed to be getting commercial toilets, so it was an estimate of like twenty five hundred for all three of them. You probably need to get a power flush because you only have you only got like a three quarter inch water line covered. Inshallah, see. Wanted to get 
I'm glad. You know what I'm saying? Uh, translate. I that. appreciate. It. You know what? Alhamdulillah. I'm glad you said that because that's Spanish to me. I don't even know what that means, but <laughs> I don't know what that means. Not what it would mean, but that's the point. The point is this. I'm glad he said that. Y'all gotta understand. We only know certain stuff, y'all. This is what we, we do. don't know nothing about no, plumbing. No, no. no, this is what we know. This our thing. It's stuff be going Shit. on. We be needing people to come Shit. in and do stuff. The fact that you mentioned that, we're gonna put you in charge of that. All right, because that this is our this is our lane. We only stay in our lane. How do they love? If anybody else got something they want to add up, then the other issue just hold the stop. Gotta let people know. Don't put nothing in there but toilet paper and dookie. Oh, they ain't gonna do that. <laughs> they not. No, they not gonna follow that. Right. It's a sign on the door. It's a sign on the door. But point being, it is. Uh, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Point being, stuff is going on that's out of our, it's not in my lane, it's not his lane. You know what I'm saying? We be overwhelmed, y'all. So a lot of times stuff doesn't get done. Not that we ignore people. A lot of times we overwhelmed. And it's difficult. I say it right here in front of the brothers. It's difficult to get men, brothers. It's difficult to get brothers to commit to anything. If it's one day real quick, brother, do it. A commitment, commitment meaning, if it don't get done, I keep we calling you. Yo, why you ain't do this? It's difficult to get brothers to do that. But guess what, though? Every brother, when they got an important issue, we got to stop everything we're doing. Every yeah. brother. If a brother contacts, whoever contacts, but if a brother, yo, Aki, this is right, uh, I got to stop what I'm doing to make sure you're good. Just be honest. But this, everybody come here to pray, but nobody stop what they're doing to make sure the place that you come to pray at is good. I'm just saying. So we're going to need, we need, we need brothers. Brothers are maintaining the mansion. The sisters don't be here the most of the time. Most of the time, it's men in here. Not for the classes. I ain't get talking about that. Most of the time, it's men in here. The men and the maintainers of the meshes. We can't do everything. When stuff don't get done, y'all, it's not because we're not trying to help people do stuff. We'd be overwhelmed. There's not enough hands. Anybody want to jump in? You're more than welcome. Inshallah. Inshallah. Um, you ready? Yeah. We're going to. Um, any questions real quick about everything that's going on in schedule? Any, any questions before we start? Scheduling-wise, this is probably going to be the last class until, I think, Friday. Give um, give Shake a little time to rest up a little bit, recoup, and then we start back Friday. I mean, maybe Friday, inshallah. Yes. Um, I think Sunday is going to be the last Sunday. This coming Sunday is probably going to be the last, the last class, Sunday. So maybe doing something Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, inshallah. Um, my advice, y'all, is Benefit. take as much advantage as you can. <clears throat> this is a person who, all the books we be reading and stuff like that, if you don't know, you be reading them books by all them shakes and all them stuff of our time, of our time. Shake and Baz and Shake What They Mean, Shake Sally Fosan. He sat with them personally, like, <coughs> and like yeah. he told us, the people who couldn't take from Ben Baz, Rahim Allah, take from Ben Baz's students. The people who couldn't take from certain scholars, you, you meet their students. And, and it's, a, it's a chain that goes back to the Prophet Islam, as far as knowledge is concerned. Even if, even if, and there's a famous statement that, about the, the life of Imam Ahmed, Rahim Allah. That when Imam Ahmed, Rahim Allah, used to teach hadith, they said 5,000 5, people came to the class. 5,000 people came to hear him teach hadith, the hadith of the Prophet Islam. They said only 500 of those 5,000, only 500 of them were actually students writing down knowledge. The other 4,500 only came to benefit from what? His character and the way he carried himself. His edit. That's what they came to. 4, 000, over 4,000 people came to just sit and benefit from the way his edit was, his character. Everybody's not going to be that, but it's always something to benefit. So that's just my personal advice to try to take advantage because uh, once he leaves, we back to what Allah gave us. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I think it's important. <clears throat> I don't, I think it's important for all the brothers here that talk about knowledge. How many brothers here love knowledge? How many brothers here would like to learn Islam and learn knowledge? Right? All right. That means that when somebody from the people of knowledge come to visit you, you need to be there. Learn what you can learn, because whatever you learn, this is not something that happens often. It's not often that somebody from the people, not, we're talking about a person who was sat with Sheikh Ben Bass for eight years. 
Shaq with Sheikh uh, Abdullah Gudayan for another eight years. Rahim Allah Ta'ala. Sat with uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Aqil. If anyone knows who that is, he was considered the Sheikh of Hanabila. He was Sheikh Uthameen's, one of his Sheikhs. He just died. We had we was blessed with the opportunity to meet him before we left, before we graduated. He died, right? Um, when you have somebody that, that benefited like that from Mashai that you know, and then there's other Mashai that you don't know, um, like Sheikh, well, most everybody here is familiar with Sheikh Saleh Fozan. I may Allah preserve him. The reality is this. Uh, when we were in school, when we were in school, um, we wanted to sit with scholars, just like everybody, you know. So when we first get there, we're trying to find out who's the scholars on the Sunnah, who's not on the, all of that stuff that we come with being from America, right? So when we get there, I remember uh, Sheikh will see Allah best. May Allah preserve him, right? Uh, he used to live not too far from us. And um, we wanted to learn from him. So we went to his masjid one morning after Fajr. And uh, I said to the Sheikh, I said, Sheikh, you know, can you um, teach us as a couple American students who want to get some private classes? He was like, no, come back next month. So I came back next month. He said, no, come back a month after. So I left, came back the month. No, he kept counting us to come. Then I stopped him. I said, Sheikh, you said like three or four months now to come back. Like, we, we need to learn something. So what he did was, <clears throat> he finally gave us a day. It started off with me, Saeed, and, and another brother. And then it got bigger and bigger and bigger, right? The, the, the point is, we want, and everyone says they want knowledge, right? You got to go get it. That's the point. You might, if Allah bless you to go sit with some of the scholars, you may go to them like, Sheikh, I might need to ask because it's one thing in a general class. The general class is one thing. But when you get the private classes, that's when you really, really learn. That's when you go back and forth. That's when you start opening the issues. We would go to Sheikh Muhammad's house uh, in the mornings after Fajr. And we would go over issues. And he'd be like, no, that's not correct. We're like, no, nah, Sheikh, I think so. All right, go get, your, we, go get the book over there. So we're in this library. Pull this book out. Pull that book out. Books laying all over the floor. And we'll do that for hours and hours. What I'm saying is if you find a scholar that give you that kind of time, that's when you're going to learn. And the point of me mentioning that is this. When you have somebody like that that comes to America, come to Philadelphia to help us in our community, that's big. This, you're talking about a person who in Masjid al-Haram in Mecca will sit in a booth and answer for tawa all day from people all over the world. But he came to visit us. This person, and the reason why I can talk about him now is because he's in the back. This person, uh, a lot of the judges in Mecca right now, in Mecca, in Qatar, in Bahrain, Oman, the judges that studied in Mecca, they studied underneath him. He was the head of the department. That means, and he mentioned this the other day, there's not an imam in Mecca right now, no masjids, except that they got to get approved by him. You got to understand the level of the people that's in front of you. So when these people come to America, to Philadelphia, it's like people don't, after he leaves, don't, I don't want to hear nobody, yeah, I want to say, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. If you're not going out to go seek the knowledge, these people here, you're not going to go learn from, you can't tell me you was trying to learn knowledge. It don't make sense. Most of us, we had to travel halfway around the world to meet people like him. These people come in your presence and, and, and people don't want to learn, that's a problem. That's a problem. So I say this to say, brothers, sisters, get as much benefit as you can. I remember, we got a lot of stories, but the, the fact of the matter is, when we first started sitting with him, he said, okay, Bring all these books. We would literally go to his house with four or five books, carry them to his house like this. Am I right? He would sit, we finish one book, all right, open up the next. I'm like, dang, another book? Another one, another one, another one. And we had to do that every day. The point of the story is this is, that side of, that side of seeking knowledge no one sees. What you see is, what you see is the brothers are giving classes, brothers teaching fiqh, brothers doing this. They doing this, but it's work that was put in. And I'm gonna tell y'all, with all truthfulness, we're not the sharpest. Cause we, we was working when we was over there. We was doing that, working and studying. There are brothers that all they did was study 24 seven. That would have been the goal. Like brothers like Mufti. He was over there, he was able to get it in way more than we were. 
Shake Tar here. He was able to get it in way more than we were. I'm just being honest. These are the things, but all the students that study, everybody knows that. The people on the outside looking in, y'all don't know that, but we know that because we was there. We lived it. So the moral of the story is when people like this come to your town, to your area, try to benefit as much as, as, as the best you can because you don't know when the opportunity will come again. Any questions? He's about to bring the shake out there. Any questions before we come out? Yes. Just point your feet, but yes. Would it be possible, inshallah, in the near future to have him or somebody else come and if the community could respond to him for a month or a week or to come again? So you're saying, is it possible for him to come again? Yes. I guess. Inshallah. You got to ask him. I mean, he, he came. He's he's been there for almost a couple of weeks now. This is the first time I'm seeing some of y'all. I'm just saying. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين أما بعد فيسعدني أن أكون بين إخوتي في هذه البلاد. He said after praising Allah تبارك وتعالى, Sheikh Hafiz Allah said he's happy to be here with everybody in this city or this country. وأن ألتقي بكم ونتحدث في أمر من أمور الدين. And to come talk to you about an issue from the issues of our deen. الذي يعتبر أعظم نعمة أنعم الله علينا بها بعد خلقنا. This deen which is the greatest blessing that Allah has given us after the fact that He created us. فلو نظر الإنسان إلى أعظم نعمة رزق بها في هذه الدنيا. He says so if a person was to look at the greatest blessing that Allah has given us in this world. لا يجد أنه من عليه بالإسلام. You will find that the greatest blessing is that Allah guided us to Islam. And He guided us to be people who practice Tawheed of Allah, that we worship only Allah, and that we don't worship any others besides Allah. Jalla wa ala. And that we're following the statement of Allah Jalla wa ala in the Quran, where Allah says in Surah Al Dhariyat, I have not created mankind and jinn except for worship. ومعنى يعبدون أي يوحدون. In the meaning of worship in the verse is means I have not created mankind and jinn except that they worship me alone that they practice tawheed. ومن نعمه جل وعلا أن أبعث لنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم. And from the blessings that Allah also gave us is that He sent the sent the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام. حيث قال جل وعلا محمد الرسول الله. As Allah said in the Quran, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. فهو رسول أرسل إلينا لتبيين شرعه جل وعلا. So he's the messenger that Allah sent in order to clarify clarify the deen to us. وهو من أفضل الأنبياء عند الله جل وعلا. And he's from the best of the prophets, عليه of the prophets of Allah تبارك وتعالى. وهو خاتمهم عليه أفضل الصلاة وأتم السلام. He's the seal or the last of the prophets of Allah جل وعلا. وقد قال الله جل وعلا فيه. الله جل وعلا said about the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. أمرا لنا في ذلك. commanding us when he said this. قوله سبحانه وما آتاكم الرسول فخذوه وما نهاكم عنه فانتهوا. he said whatever the messenger has given you then you take it and whatever he told you to stay away from then stay away from it. أي ما أمرنا الله به أي ما أمرنا به صلى الله عليه وسلم. 
وجب علينا أن نفعله. That whatever the Prophet sallallahu commanded us with is obligatory for us to take it and follow it. وما نهانا عنه صلى الله عليه وسلم وجب علينا أن نجتنبه. And whatever he prohibited us from and told us to stay away from is obligatory for us to stay away from it. وإن أشرف شيء للمسلم أن يتبع محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. And the most honorable, honorable thing that a Muslim can do is follow the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. ظاهرا وباطنا. Apparently and internally. ظاهرا بالتمثل بما كان عليه صلى الله عليه وسلم. Apparently by following outwardly. Okay. Externally. Externally. Externally following what the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم told us to do. في هيئته. In the way we look. من حيث إطلاق اللحية وتقصير الثياب. The way he looks. Growing his beard, having not having dragon thobes, ومن حيث المشي وغيرها. How he walks, ومن جهة الباطن. And as it as it as it relates to internally, أن يكون كما كان صلى الله عليه وسلم. That would be the way that the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام was. لقوله جل وعلا. Due to the statement of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. لقوله جل وعلا. إنما محمد رسول الله. That Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. وكونه رسول. And the statement that he is a messenger. فنحن مطالبون باتباعه. Then we are requested or required to follow him. ولقوله جل وعلا. And like the statement of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. إنك لا على خلق عظيم. That indeed you are upon excellent character. فبين الله جل وعلا. So Allah clarified. أن رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم ذو خلق عظيم. That his messenger was the possessor of great character and manners. فإذا علمنا ذلك. So if we understand that. فقد قال صلى الله عليه وسلم. Then as the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام said. في حديث معاوية رضي الله عنه. In the hadith of Muawiya, may Allah be pleased with him. إنما بعثت لأح إنما بعثت لأحسن محاسن الأخلاق. That he said, indeed, I was sent to perfect or make our character or morals better. فبعث صلى الله عليه وسلم. So the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام was sent. بمكارم الأخلاق. With the highest level of character. وقال صلى الله عليه وسلم. So the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام he said. في المتفق عليه. And the hadith that is in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. إن من خياركم أحسنكم أخلاقا. That the best of you are the ones that have the best character. فيجب علينا أن نعرف ما ينبغي للمسلم من أخلاق. So it is very important for every Muslim to know what is upon him to have in terms of having good manners and أخلاق. والأخلاق التي ينبغي عليها المسلم. So the أخلاق or the mannerisms that a Muslim should have. لا تكفي فيها محاضرة أو محاضرتين. It's not sufficient to to say it all in one or two lessons. بل الأخلاق عدة. Rather there are a lot of different أخلاق or a lot of manners. وهذه الأخلاق التي ينبغي أن يتحلى بها المسلم. And the mannerisms or character that a Muslim must possess. هي في تعاملاته مع نفسه أولا. Is how a person, how a Muslim deals with himself first. How a Muslim deals with himself first. وفي تعاملاته مع أهله من زوجاته. And how he deals with his spouses, his spouse and his family. وكذا ذلك في تعاملاته في تربية أبنائه. And likewise, how he is with educating his children. وكذا ذلك في تعاملاته مع إخوانه المسلمين. And after that, and how he deals with his brothers in Islam, his brothers and sisters in Al Islam. In كان قريبا فله أحكام. And if they are close to him, then there are legislation that 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 is specific for that. وإن كان جارا فله أحكام. And if he is a neighbor, then there are neighbors. There there are rulings pertaining to a neighbor. Relative, close to him. Close to relatives. I'm sorry, relatives. وإن كان يلقاه في المسجد فله أحكام. And the ones who meet him in the masjid, then there are rulings related to that as well. 
وفي أي تعامل يتعامل به مع أخيه المسلم. In any type of interaction that he may have with his brother Muslim. وكذلك أخلاق المسلم مع غير المسلمين. And likewise, there are manners that we are supposed to have when we deal with non-Muslims. فقد ضرب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أعلى الأمثال في التعامل مع غير المسلمين. So the Prophet ﷺ gave one of the greatest examples of how we should deal with non-Muslims. وإذا أردنا أن نفصل كل واحدة منها. And if we were to give details about every single uh, incident like that took place like that, then it will not suffice us to have one or two lectures for that either. For every character, every character that the Prophet has, it will, each one of them will be his own lecture. سوف نأخذ أمثلة من كل تصور من هذه التصورات. So we're going to take, however, we're going to take uh, a small summarized uh, picture of each piece of character that we can benefit from. فكان صلى الله عليه وسلم في تعامله مع أهل بيته. So we're going to talk with about the Prophet ﷺ and how was he with the people of his own house, his family. قد ضرب أعلى الأمثلة في ذلك. And there are a lot of examples that we can speak about that. فلم يكن سبابا ولا متسخطا. He was not one that cursed his family. إيش متسخط؟ إيه يسخط على صرخ على المرة. Okay. يتسخط إيش ما متسخط؟ يعني. He wasn't one that was harsh or yeah. Uh, was he didn't curse uh, and he wasn't harsh to his family. He was easy with them. فيما تتع... فيما من نسائه صلى الله عليه وسلم. He wasn't like that. So basically, whatever his wives did, he wasn't mean to them. He didn't curse them, and etc. بل كان يستحمل ما يصدر منهن من سوء أخلاق. And he would be patient and persevere. Um, with his spouses even though they may have had bad character towards him at times. Even though that is not permissible some, in cases for a, mu a, Muslim, a woman to act like that with her husband. So even when, even when his wives would uh, as we say in our terms, get out of line or be a, cer a certain way to him, the Prophet Sallallahu would be patient and he would deal with it in a certain way. And he was one who had more than one wife. So he wasn't just dealing with one woman, he was dealing with multiple women and they may have had the same issue at times. And even though he had more than one wife, he never left off and stopped giving all of them their rights. Even in the, the, his last moments of, before his death, يقول, he used to ask, where am I tonight? Meaning, which wife? Which of my wives' house am I supposed to be at? Because it's her right. It's, that night is hers. Which one of the wives? Where should I be at tonight? And this is when he was on his deathbed. And this shows that the Prophet ﷺ was just between his wives. Based on what is clear and what he was able to be uh, just with. So as far as the Muslims, we are concerned that we are supposed to be the best with our wives. And if you have more than one wife, then you should be good to all of them. And this is just one example of the Prophet ﷺ and his manners when dealing with this group of people, meaning his family, specifically his wives. وفي تعامله صلى الله عليه وسلم مع الصبيان 
and his uh, manners when they came to him dealing with children and young kids. And we also have examples of that. فقد أمر الوالد أن يحرص في تربية أبنائه أن يحرص في تربية أبنائه كيف؟ والدة الوالد الوالد قد ضربه قد إيش؟ أمر الوالد بأن يحرص في تربية أبنائه He commanded the mother to be good in raising her children when they're smaller والدة والوالد الوالد والوالد I'm sorry the parents the parents the Prophet والسلام, urged the parents to be good in educating and, and nurturing their children. And this has been uh, specified more specifically to the father. وسلم, what the Prophet والسلام, said, all, and this is a translation, all of you are responsible and all of you are responsible for that which is underneath you, which you're responsible for. وذكر في الحديث and also was mentioned in the hadith أن الوالد مسؤول عن رعيته في بيته الوالد الوالد الأب The father is responsible for what goes on in the affairs of his home. فينبغي للمسلم So it's important for a Muslim أن يحرص على تربية أبنائه that he is diligent about educating his children. ولو كان بينه وبين زوجه انفصال. Even if the man and the woman are separated or divorced. لأن أفضل من يرب الأبناء. The best of those to raise the children. بعد بلوغ السبع سنوات. Once they reach the age of seven years. هم الآباء. Is the father. لأنه يرب على الابن على الرجولة وعلى احترام الآخرين. Because the father is going to teach his son masculinity and how to respect other men. وسلطة الرجل على الأبناء أقوى من سلطة المرأة عليهن. And the power that a man hold over his children is stronger than the power that a woman has over her children. مع رحمته بأبنائه. Even with his mercy for his children, and even with him having mercy for his children. كما كان صلى الله عليه وسلم يداعب الصبيان في ذلك. Like the Prophet ﷺ used to deal with the children like that. فقد لقي صلى الله عليه وسلم أحد الصبيان في المدينة ومعه طير يقال له النغري. طير. He met a child who had a in Medina and the child had a little bird. Was it a طير? A bird. A bird. A small was, bird, and he gave the bird a name. Was, uh, uh, Nugri, Nugri. Nugri. Yeah. The name of the bird was Nugri. Wal, ismuhu Umar. And the child's name was Umar. بعد أيام فقال له يا أبا عمير ما فعل النغير. So he saw him a couple of days later, and he asked, "Ya Aba Umar, ما فعل النغير? What happened with Nugir? What happened to the bird? ماذا صنعت به؟ What did you do with the bird? مداعبة له. مداعبة؟ أيوة. بس النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام يسمونه أبو أمير. مين؟ اسمه عمر صح؟ أيوة. الطفل. أيوة. بس مناداه أبو أمير. يا أبا عمير. أيوة. يعني ليش؟ كذا تكنية له. جيد. طيب. ممتاز. So the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام when he called the boy, his boy, his name was Omar. But he called, the Prophet called him Ya Aba Umair. Umair is like Aba, like meaning the father of Umair. It was like respect for him. Pay attention to that. A lot of older brothers, we don't respect the young bulls, right? We talk to them crazy and all that. The Prophet والسلام, he was respectful and decent to the young bulls. He said, Ya Aba Umair. He said, What happened to the bird? What did you do with the bird? <laughs> He asked him what happened to the bird joking with him. وكان صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا رفع له الصبي قبله صلى الله عليه وسلم. And the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, if he if he picked up a child, he would kiss him. كل ذلك رحمة ورأفة منه صلى الله عليه وسلم. All of that out of mercy and being soft with the child. هذا من تعامله صلى الله عليه وسلم مع أهل بيته ومع الأبناء. 
This is how he would deal with his household, meaning his wives, and the children also. These are examples. وقد روى أبو هريرة رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حق المسلم على المسلم ست. And Abu Huraira رضي الله عنه he narrated the hadith on the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that the right of a Muslim on every other Muslim is six things. هذا الحديث في حق تعامل المسلم مع إخوانه المسلمين. And in this hadith, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم mentioned the rights that every Muslim how we supposed to deal with one another, other Muslims. التي ينبغي نحن أن نتأسى بها. What is really in this hadith is on us to follow this hadith and practice this hadith, the things in this hadith. فقال حق المسلم على المسلم ست. قلنا ما هي يا رسول الله. So he said the right of every Muslim and another Muslim is six things. So they said, meaning the Sahaba, what are they, O Messenger of Allah? قال أولا إذا لقيه فسلم عليه. The first thing he said, if you meet him, y'all come across paths, you supposed to give the person the salams. We know the salams, right? السلام عليكم. فينبغي للمسلم إذا لقي أخاه المسلم أن يسلم عليه. فيقول له السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. So for a Muslim, when you come across the path of another Muslim, you're supposed to give him the salam today. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. ويرد عليه أخوه المسلم بقوله وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. And you respond as a Muslim to your Muslim brother or sister. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. الثاني أنه إذا دعاه إلى وليمة ولا سيما وليمة عرس قال إذا دعاك فأجب. He said the second thing, if a person invites you to a walima, meaning the walima of the marriage. فينبغي أنه إذا دعي دعاه أخوه المسلم إلى وليمة أن يجيب هذه الدعوة وأن يحضر إليه. That you respond to the invite and that you go to the walima. هذا من حق المسلم على أخيه المسلم. This is from a person's right over the other person when they invite you that you respond to the invitation. وذكر الثالث أنه إذا استنصح أن ينصح له. Number three says the third right that if a person advises seeks advice from you, they come to you seeking advice about something that you give them advice. فلو أتاك أخوك المسلم وأراد منك نصيحة في أمر. فلا بد أن تبدي له النصيحة التي تبرأ بها ذمتك. He says, so if a person comes to you asking you advice on something, it is on you to advise them the best you can so that that responsibility is moved from your neck, as we say. It's no longer on your slate as far as being responsible for responding. وهذه النصيحة على قسمين. And this advice is two types. إن كنت تخبيرا فيما استنصحك به. فوجب عليك أن تنصحه في ذلك. If كنتش خبيرا. Ah, if you have knowledge about what you've been asked about, then it's on you to respond with the knowledge that you know about whatever they're asking you about, whatever that knowledge may be. If you know something, you're supposed to tell them. فمثلا لو أتاك وطلب منك مشورة في شراء سيارة معينة. So if they come to you and they they seek advice on how to buy a specific car, and you have knowledge about doing that. وأنت متخصص في البيع والشراء في السيارات. And you, that's your, that's your twist. You buy and sell cars. That's what you do. فوجب عليك أن تنصح بأفضل شيء يفيده ويكون فيه منفعة منفعة له. Then you give him the best advice that he needs to help be a benefit to your Muslim brother, and you aid him in that. فهذا مثال للنصيحة لأخيك المسلم. This is the, this is an example of giving advice to your brother Muslim. وعليها يقاس بقية الأمور. And like this, we we compare to other issues as well. The same way we gave advice in that, we do that in other affairs as well. الأمر الثاني في النصيحة لو لم تكن خبيرا في هذا الأمر. The second part of the type of advice. The first part was if you're aware. The second part, if you're unaware, meaning you don't know about the thing that they're asking you about. بمعنى أنك لا لا تعلم. أو لست خبيرا فيما استنصحك فيه أخوك المسلم. Meaning you don't have any knowledge about the thing that that person is asking about. You have no no information at all. فلا يجوز لك شرعا أن تنصح له وأنت غير عالم. So it's not permissible for you to give advice about something you know nothing about. من أجل ألا يقع في أمر 
So that that Muslim don't fall into an issue that you advise him about that you know nothing about and that way you can save yourself from getting that sin. However, what is incumbent upon you what is incumbent for you is for you to say, I don't have any knowledge about that. And I don't know anything about it. ولكن إن كنت تعلم شخصا خبيرا في ذلك فترشده إليه. However, if you know somebody that you trust, that وتعينه في ذلك. If you know somebody that you trust, that you can um, refer them to, then you refer them to someone that can aid them. بهذا تكون إذا استنصحك أن تنصح له. And this is how we implement the hadith. If someone seeks your your aid and assistance, then you aid, give them aid and assistance. وتكون عاملا بهذا الحديث. And then in this case, we will be implementing that particular hadith. الأمر الرابع أنه إذا عطس أو إذا عطس فحمد الله فيجب عليك أن تشمد. If a person like in the next part, if a person sneezes. Then they say Alhamdulillah. Then it's for you to say Yarhamakullah. فهذا من حق المسلم على أخيه المسلم. And this is the rights that a Muslim has over another Muslim. الأمر الخامس أنه إذا مرض فعليه أن يعود. That was the fourth one. This is the fifth one. If a person is sick, then you must visit them. فهذا واجب المسلم على أخيه المسلم. This is the rights that a Muslim has over his brother Muslim. الأمر السادس والأخير في الحديث and the sixth one and the last one أنه إذا مات فعليه أن يشيع جنازته and if they die then it is upon you to pray and 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 participate in the janaza فهذه حقوق ستة these are the six rights ذكرها رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم that the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام mentioned في حق المسلم على أخيه المسلم. For the rights of a Muslim over his brother Muslim in Islam. وغيرها كثيرة. And there are more. There are more. لكن هذه أمثلة منها. However, this is a small example from them. كذلك من أخلاق المسلم مع إخوته المسلمين إذا كانوا جيرانا لهم. And likewise, the rights that a Muslim has with his brother Muslim in Islam and their and their their neighbors. أن يكف أذاه عن أخيه المسلم. That you don't harm your neighbors. وأن يحرص ألا يكون متحملا للآثام ببأذية أخيه المسلم. And you don't want to be sinful. You don't want to carry the burden of committing any type of transgressions against your Muslim neighbors. كذلك هنالك أخلاق للمسلم مع الكفار في تعاملهم. And likewise, there is mannerisms that a Muslim must have when dealing with non-Muslims. فينبغي للمسلم أن يتأسى برسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في تعامله مع الكفار. Then a person must implement the behavior of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام as it relates to dealing with the non-Muslims. فالتعامل له أحكام. تختلف باختلاف الأمكنة والأزمنة والأحوال. So the way the Prophet Muhammad Sallam dealt with them, it depends on the time, the place, and the situation. The situation, the time, the place, and the situation. فقد كان لرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ابن يهودي أو شاب يهودي يخدمه. The Prophet ﷺ had a young boy who was a Jew. He was Jewish that he used to uh, serve. serve the Prophet ﷺ. هذا اليهودي. So the young Jewish boy died. No, he got sick. I met it. I'm sorry, he got sick. فأتى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يعوده في مرضه. So when he got sick, the Prophet ﷺ visited him while he was sick, the young Jewish boy. أي يعود هذا الابن اليهودي. Meaning he went to go visit the Jewish boy that was working for him. فدعاه إلى الإسلام. So when he went to visit him, he invited him to accept shahada, become a Muslim. فنظر الابن إلى أبيه. So the Jewish boy looked up at his own father. أبوه اليهودي. فقال له أطع أبا القاسم أي أبوه قال للابن أطع أبا القاسم. He looked at his father, who was also Jewish, and his father, who was Jewish, said to his Jewish son, "Obey Abu al-Qasim, which is Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, meaning follow what he says, obey him." فنطق الشهادتين ثم توفي. So the young boy 
pronounced the shahada and then he died, he passed away. فخرج رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فرحا بأنه أسلم قبل أن يموت. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he left out and he was very happy with the fact that the young boy became a Muslim before he died. فلذلك يجوز للمسلم أن يعود الكافر في مرضه الذي هو مريض فيه. He said therefore based on that hadith it's permissible for a Muslim to visit a non-Muslim who may be sick. It's permissible to visit a non-Muslim who may be sick based on a hadith. وأن يستغل التعامل ذلك في الدعوة إلى دين الإسلام. And when they do visit a non-Muslim who is sick, that they should spend that time. They should spend that time trying to invite them to Islam. فقد قال صلى الله عليه وسلم. As the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم said. لأن يهدي الله بك رجلا واحدا خير لك من حمر النعم. The face, the famous hadith that if one person comes to Islam based on you inviting them, then that's better than one red camel. فتعاملك مع مع الكافر لعله يسلم بسبب تعاملك معه. The point of the hadith where it says it's better than one red camel to you is because with the Arabs that was like a very very expensive uh, piece of property to have the camel. So that was like the best thing the you could have camel. at the time. The, right. the red camel. It was the best thing you could have at the time. So the hadith says if one person, if one person comes to Islam because of you, it's better than that red camel, just so everybody knows what's the point of the red camel. Something very expensive with the Arabs during that time. فَيَنْبَغِي لَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ فِي هَذِهِ الْبِلَادِ أَنْ تَكُونُوا دُعَاةً لِلْدِّينِ بِأَخْلَاقِكُمْ And it's important for you in this country, specifically, to be cause of the, the religion of Islam with your manners. With your manners. فكم رجلا أو امرأة قد يسلم بسبب تعاملك معهم. How many people can accept Islam just by the way you being good to the people, just being good to people. فهذه أكبر نعمة ترزقون فيها لو أن أحدا أسلم على يديك بسبب تعاملك معه. And this could be one of the best things that can happen to you because of your mannerisms, someone accepts Islam from your hands. وتدخل في حديث قوله صلى الله عليه وسلم لأن يهدي الله بك رجلا واحدا خير لك من حمر النعم. And if you were to do that, then you would enter into the hadith of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام when he mentioned that if you were to guide one person to Islam, it would be better than you than a sheik, a red camel, meaning the most expensive piece of property that the Arabs would have during that time. هذه بعض أو جزء من المعالم التي تعتبر جزءا قليلا جدا في أخلاق المسلم التي ينبغي أن يتحلى بها. He said this is just a small glimpse. This is just a small few manners and characteristics that he's mentioned that it's obligatory for the Muslims to follow and practice. This is just a small portion. ولو أردنا الحديث فيها لما تفينا لمدة عام كامل ونحن نتكلم. He said, if we were to go through every single one, we'd be here for a year, and we still wouldn't have finished the reality of this type of situation. If we sat here for a year, it wouldn't be enough. فالصدق لوحده محاضر. Because, for example, being truthful, just being truthful, that's a class by itself. والأمانة لوحدها محاضر. الأمانة to be trustworthy. For a person to be trustworthy, that's a whole different conversation. That's a class. والسلام لوحده محاضر. السلام لوحدي. السلام. أحكام السلام. أحكام السلام. The salams, giving the salams, that's a maha, that's a class by itself. The rulings about a salam, why they can give them the salams back and forth. وعليها فقيس. He said, and with that you can compare all of the other different things that everything will need its own class for itself. ولكن كما قالت عائشة رضي الله عنها عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لما سئلت عن أخلاقه. قالت كان خلقه القرآن. But just like the hadith of Aisha رضي الله عنها, when she was asked about the character and the behavior of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, her response about his character was his character and his manners are the Quran. فينبغي أن نتأسى به عليه أفضل الصلاة وأتم السلام. So what we're supposed to be doing is following and practicing the way the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم taught us. 
وأسأل الله جل وعلا أن ينفعنا بما سمعنا وبما ذكرنا وأن يكون هذا الأمر خالصا لوجهه الكريم. He said, I ask Allah جل وعلا to benefit us all from what we heard and to make us sincere in our practice. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. جزاك الله خير. Thank you.